All righty, well, um, first, first Peter, there's some themes, let's just go over them very, very briefly. The first uh, is expect suffering, um, not only when you do wrong, you can expect suffering because you're going to be chastened by God, uh, but when you do right, you can expect suffering because you're going to be uh, persecuted by the world. Mm-hmm. So suffering is the lot of the Christian, and uh, and and Peter over and over again, and and the rest of Scripture says that we're to suffer it uh, patiently, uh, enduringly, uh, without reviling, because uh, that is what we were intended. Suffering is intended for us as our lot, uh, and uh, we follow the example of Christ who, when he suffered, did not revile. Uh, we're going to be talking about that, obviously. Uh, the other, uh, well, there's several main themes. The other one I want, to, I want to stress is that Peter, as all the other epistles, very, very practical, uh, often acts, asks explicitly or implicitly, okay, now in light of this, how do we live? Okay, and that's, that's what I want, I want us to focus on. There are some, uh, some difficult to understand passages that we're going to touch on today, probably next week as well. Um, but we need to keep the main thing, the main thing. The main thing is Christ suffered, uh, um, uh, although he was righteous, we will suffer although we, we are righteous. And how then shall we live? Loving each other, supporting each other, and in obedience and submission to Christ. So, so if there's an overall theme of Peter's letter, those those two things are really it. Um, uh, Peter said of Paul's writings uh, that some of them are hard to understand, as are the rest of the scriptures, and um, and I find. I find Peter's writing a little bit more difficult to understand in some places than I do Paul's. Uh, Paul's seems to me to be uh, on a, at a at a higher level of of logical flow than than Peter's is. But I'm not judging either of them. They're all scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit. So, okay, let's start and and review. Back in uh, chapter two. First of all, any questions based on what we've covered so far? Anything pop into your minds? Um, okay, chapter two. Let's go. Let's go back to thirteen and and go through twenty five. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or the governors, who are sent by him, by the king, to punish those who do wrong, excuse me, and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, honor the king. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is for it for it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. Okay, now, now that that's very, very important. Why do you bear up for the pain of uh, in the pain of unjust suffering, because you're conscious of God. Not because you're a good person, not because you're a patient person, but because you know now that this is what God expects of you. Not only expects, but this is what God has planned for you. But how is it to your credit if you receive a blessing for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. And, and, and this one... This one ought to be in bold and underlined. To this you were called. Okay. So when, when people hear 
what in many places is is the modern gospel. You know, you you accept, you receive Jesus, you submit to Him, whatever it is. Your life is now going to be the abundant life. You know, um, and and it's true. It is one of the parts of abundance is an abundance of suffering because that to to this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. So if we're to be conformed to the image of Christ, and, and Christ has given us an example, and this is a constant example before us, how how should we expect to be conformed to his image if we don't if we don't undergo the same kind of suffering for for righteousness sake that he did? He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. So we've got a great, a great reference there to Isaiah 53 and, and a, great, um, a great direction for us. When we are insulted, whether it's by um, uh, unbelievers who, don't, who, who, who are en perhaps envious, perhaps jealous, uh, perhaps just angry at what they see in a Christian. Uh, we get insulted by them. Um, and, I, and I remember I, um, years and years and years ago, um, a, young, a young man uh, who had known me in my, in, what, in, who had known me in my, in my wilder days, uh, and who I met a couple of years later, and Told him, told him about how I how I came to Christ and how it's changed my life, and and uh, and this was a junior officer, so I expected some respect, you know. No, he said, "Oh, so you're one of those holy roller guys now? You're like Ted. What was the guy's name? Ted, who fell? Um, the TV evangelist, Ted. St um, oh, come on." Well, there's so many. I think. Okay, well, there was yeah. one that came on crying, it's against you, and you only have I sinned. And, oh, well, Jimmy, anyway, whoever he was. Jimmy so, Swagger. Jimmy Swagger. Thank you very much. We so, call him Ted. So, <laughs> me. Ted, 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 Jimmy. Um, so the point is, the point is, I was, I was shocked at the time, only because I was new, and I was naive. And I, and, and I didn't realize that this is what I should expect from unbelievers, you know. Um, now, praise God that he has, he has chosen to use the life of joy and peace in believers as a powerful witness uh, to non-believers, as a matter of fact. That's, you know, that's his purpose. And there was a great story on um, Wednesday, a young lady that I met, um, who, who was saved, didn't know exactly how that happened, didn't know what Christ had done for her, but she was saved. And I said, okay, so how, how, how did you start to attend this particular church and want to go to church? And he said, because, she said, this friend of mine was just so full of joy and happiness all the time, regardless of what was going on in her life, she said, I just needed to know what was going on. How can I get me some of that? And that's, uh, and that's God's purpose for joy in the life of a Christian. So, okay. Now we get into chapter three. <sighs> Wives. In the same way. In the same way as what? In the same way as Christ submitting to suffering. Okay. Even when he did nothing to deserve suffering. Wives in the same way as Christ be submitted to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So it's so wonderful that, that wives, wives who are married to believers don't have to worry about this. They don't have to be submissive. Okay, that's, that's humor. It's easier. That's, it's easier. That's humor. 
Okay. <laughs> the point is, how much, how much more should wives with a believing husband be submissive and follow the example of Christ? Um, and then, and then we've got um, we've got the examples of Christ, uh, the examples of Sarah, who who follow, who trusted in God, and Abraham. We know was not a perfect husband right. in any way. Uh, Abraham, essentially to save his own skin, uh, gave his wife over uh, to hey, take her. You like her, take her. Um, so. Uh, let's take a moment to examine the word, the word revile, um, and examine ourselves to see if we're following the example of Christ. When, when, when it says that Christ did not revile in return, uh, and this is the example that, that wives and husbands will see are supposed to follow, every Christian is supposed to follow, that word revile... Um, you know, it, it's kind of an old-fashioned word. You don't hear it very often, you know, in the coffee shop. You know what the Greek root is for revile? Blasphemeo. What does that sound like? Uh, blaspheme. Okay, we can, we can blaspheme. You know, I always thought of, of blasphemy as something you can only do toward God. That's, that's just not right. Okay? It just means to speak evil of. Okay, so if you are spoken evil of, you don't blaspheme in return. You don't speak evil of in return. And that was very helpful for me. Um, uh, we, 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 we think of Christ's words on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, he had an opportunity there as, as God to, to revile them, to... To treat them in the same way that he had he had treated Pharisees in the past, you know, to be just upfront with you, brood of vipers. But he didn't. And and if there was an ex, you know an opportunity for him to leave the most powerful example of not reviling in return when you were when you are reviled, it would have been right there on the cross. Jesus recognizes the sinful, ignorant, fleshly actions of his murderers and asks for God's grace on them. And our question, should we do less for our believing spouses who are brought, as we shall see in a moment, bought with, bought with the same blood of Christ as we are? We must obey. God will judge both husbands and wives. Um, now, both, both husbands and wives can be, um, should expect to be tried uh, by the other. Uh, spouses are used by God when their actions, attitudes, and words tempt us to revile or act out our fleshly nature. Now, um, I say again in a humorous note, I'm sure none of you have ever experienced a temptation to, to act out your fleshly nature uh, when, you're, when your spouse uh, is less than perfect. But that's what we're called to. And, and husbands, of course, of course, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, are called to cherish. Okay, wives are called to submit. Husbands are called to cherish. That's th the basis of the word honor has to do with money. Uh, when you when you read in the Bible that, that that elders who you know work hard in the word who teach well are worthy of double honor, that's just money, um, and and in the and also the broader context of 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 cherishing in every way, and that's what husbands are called to do to their wives. The wife has to be seen as precious, bought bought with the same price. If both are believers, bought with the same price as as the husband was, and vice versa. So, uh, verse 7, you husbands, in the same way, and the same way is remembering the sufferings of Christ, live with your wife in an understanding way. And that, that word understand is, is a Greek word gnosis, which just means knowledge, but it's a deep knowledge, treasuring her tenderly as unique, Special, the one God chose for you and the one you have committed to. Okay. As with someone weaker, 
since she is a woman. So what that's saying is because she is a woman, she is weaker. Okay, there's just, I mean, there's no argument about that from Scripture. Treat her as someone weaker since she is a woman. Um, and the root word from that is the same word from which we get the word gynecology, which is woman's medicine stuff. Uh, it, it just specifically means feminine pertaining to a woman. It has nothing to do with culture or ethnicity or anything else. It's just a woman is to be considered weaker. And in the original it talks about, and you, you, you probably have in a number of your translations, since she is a weaker vessel, and that word vessel just means a, a body, um, physically weaker. Uh, that, 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 um, that container that, that contains our, our soul and our spirit is a vessel. That's our body. Paul also calls it a tent. Um, and women's bodies, uh, by and large, are, are weaker than men's. And that's why men are, are to treat them tenderly. Um, I don't know if I've shared before, but I, I mean, I, I've gotten clear messages from Scripture through my conscience, or, yeah, from Scripture through my conscience, David, treat your wife tenderly. Um, and, yes, sir? Well, aside from that, I think Peter is a little bit chauvinistic here. A, a little bit what? Well, he has, <coughs> how many babies has he had? How many babies? I don't think scripture says. I know it was married. I'd like to have a baby. I mean, he's, he's talking physically. He had, how many babies did he have? Yeah. I don't, I don't think it says. No, uh, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. I mean, they're not weaker. I, would, I, I can't imagine me giving birth to a kid. I wouldn't want that at all. If they could hook you up and you could have the pain, it'd probably kill you. Oh, okay. Well, um, I I. Th- Sorry. I think I hear what you're saying. I mean, Peter makes it very, very clear that they are that they are weaker physically. Now, uh, I know that the astronaut program is looking at putting in more women because they handle certain stresses better. They do well, uh, more. Um, uh, they do better than men with with low gravity environments, that kind of thing. So there are ways in which women. I mean, praise God for women, especially my wife. There are ways in which women are stronger. He's talking about, by and large, physically. Um, so, the presupposition is that she's a woman and physically weaker. She must be treated differently than a man and show her honor, again, having to do with great value or preciousness. Um, and then, and then the, last, um, the last portion of that is so important a uh, few guys. Why, why do you treat your wives with honor and precious and the weaker vessel? What does it say? So, so say, say again. So Show the yeah. Okay. So um, there's lots of places where Scripture is clear that if you want your prayers to be heard, if you want your worship to be accepted, there, there are certain ways that, that God sets up. We need to be cleansed. We need to have our sins confessed, okay? um, et cetera, et cetera. We know that we're praying in accordance with God's will. Okay? And this one is just so specific. Okay? God said, you, wanna, you, know, you want me to hear your prayers, you treat your wife right. Uh, and that, that should be, you know, if a man needed additional uh, impetus uh, to, uh, to treat his wife as, as a weaker vessel tenderly and with honor and with respect and with love, don't, you know, understand that that is a prerequisite, a laid out clear prerequisite to God hearing prayers. So, so I, thank, uh, I thank God that he, that he put that in there because... It, it's a, it's almost a slap in the face. You know, it's almost saying, w- wake up. Okay, this is not, this is not an optional thing. You want me to hear you, you do what I tell you. You treat your wife like a weaker vessel, treasure and ten- tenderly. Okay. Um, so verse, verse eight and nine, and this is, this is clear. So I don't want to 
we don't need to go into it very deeply, but it's a good way to sum up what we've heard so far. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. What, what does sympathetic mean? Have the, have the same understanding of someone else's suffering that, that they have. It, it's not empathetic. It doesn't mean that you have to be experiencing the same thing, but you have, this is part of tenderness, to be sympathetic, to recognize that, okay, especially in the context of husbands and wives, my wife doesn't respond to things like I do, but I'm called to be sympathetic. I'm called to, to reach out to try to understand what she's going through rather than, than, than say, well, I, I wouldn't react like that. Obviously, she's a weaker vessel and, and push her aside. No, that's not where, what we're called for. Um, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Now that's, you know, Every Tuesday morning, some guys get together and we talk about how to do this week. You know? and, and one of the questions we, we ask ourselves is, were you disrespectful to anybody? Did you respond with evil for evil or evil for blessing this week? And, and, and um, this, this is one of the areas, based on my personal uh, experience and experience with other people, that, that is it, it, one of the last ways in which the flesh keeps its claws into, into people, uh, men especially. Uh, although I've observed it on very, very, very rare occasions from, from, from women. Um, so, so we're told, this is, this is an imperative, okay? Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Do we do that? Do, do we repay insult with blessing? And because, again, and this is a summary verse, because to this, meaning don't repay evil uh, for evil, um, be compassionate, be humble, all of that, because to this you are called that you may inherit a blessing. So all of this is another, another promise. You do these things, and up above it said, it says God will hear your prayers, and here it says you may inherit a blessing. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech, etc. So down to verse thirteen. Again, this is talking about suffering. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. So it, it, it's God's will for us that we suffer, to conform us to the image of his son. His son set an example for us. We suffer for the sake of righteousness, we're blessed. Because that's, that's, how, that's how God pays back persecution in, uh, for the sake of righteousness. Do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. But here, here's the key. It says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with, um, yet with gentleness and reverence. So this, this question of being willing to give a defense for the hope that's in you is in a very, very specific context. It's in the context of joy and suffering. It's in the context of not... Um, not reviling when you are reviled, and that will be and that will be noticed. Just like this young lady uh, that I talked about saw her her friend full of joy, full of peace in in bad circumstances, and it caused her to say exactly this: "Give me, give me a reason for the hope that's in you." Okay? And we're all called to do that. The prerequisite. Okay, there are two parts, obviously. The first is live a life so that people, especially unbelievers, will say, this life is different. There is something going on here, okay? And I want some of that. And the second thing is, is be ready to give an answer. 
And that was another thing that saddened me about this young lady. She's been going to a local church, it's not important which one, for, for months. And as we got to talk, she, she didn't know, um, she didn't have an understanding of why this friend of hers, in fact, had, had hope and joy. She thought it had something to do with attending church. Uh, I started talking to her about the gospel. She had not the beginning of an understanding of what the gospel is and how joy and peace results from, uh, from obedience to the gospel. And, um, and, that's, and that saddened me because any, you know, I would pray that anybody that walks out of this place in one, in one visit has some general sense of what, of what the gospel is. I know y'all do. Uh, so the question for us is, should somebody say to us, you know, I've been looking at your life. And people are looking, by the way. I've been looking at your life, and I see the way you responded to such and such. And I know how I would have responded to such and such. So what's going on with you? Are you ready? to give an answer for the hope that you have within you with gentleness and, and, and precision. Are you? Um, I, would, I would pray that you are, and I would encourage you, if you are not, to spend some time equipping yourself to do that. Uh, I'll be happy to spend time with you. There's resources, I mean, there's resources. Your small group leader be happy to spend time with you. Other believers would be happy to spend time with you. But be, be, be sure that if someone says to you, you know, I really like the way you handle that situation, uh, you can say, let me tell you why. Okay? Um, and and I, remember, I remember years and years ago, again, um, new believer, uh, I was on an airplane, and... Um, uh, I, I put my briefcase on top of someone's coat that was in the, the overhead thing. And, and he got up, threw his coat out. I catch my, my briefcase in my face. I catch his coat in my face. And, and I was right about here, right about here, when, when I just... It just stopped, and and I and I said, I am so sorry. I'd like to put my briefcase up there, and I can I fold your coat, please, and put it on top of my briefcase so this won't happen again. And the whole plane was looking, um, and I didn't, I, you know, I was still enough of a coward to say, it's, I'm I'm treating you like this because I'm. Uh, Jesus commands me to, um, but but it was still the whole plane was looking, and I got, got I, I I God working in me got some applause from the rest of the plane because of that, which is very very interesting. But that that's the kind of example um, when the Holy Spirit is working in us to to sometimes be surprised at our reaction, recognizing how far it is from what flesh would have called me to do. Um, so, anyway, pray God for that. Um, so, what's the key? Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense. So, w what does it mean to sanctify Christ in your hearts? Um, what does the word sanctification mean? Sanctification means separate. Okay? Um, when, you, when you think about the Holy of Holies in Latin, the sanctum sanctorum, it is the, it is the double separated place. That's what sanctification is. And, and sanctification can be thought about uh, by four prepositions. Uh, the first is one, uh, uh, from the world, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, to God, three, for God's glory, and D, by the blood of Jesus. So biblical sanctification is both a position and a process. We are, we are sanctified, we are set apart for God when we receive the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. 
in faith. Um, and, and, and it's a process whereby uh, God continues to work in us. We are sanctified as a continuing process when, when we continue to obey the gospel, continue to obey the, the imperatives of Scripture. And that's pleasing to God. Can you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry? From the world. Can you repeat that again? From the world. To yeah, the from the world. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. To God. 1 Peter 2, 9. For God's glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And 1 Peter 2, 9. And by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10, 10 and 29. Hebrews what? 10. Hebrews 10, 10 and 10, 29. So we mature and grow in sanctification as we live in rebellion to Satan and dedicate ourselves to God. You know, we, Michael has used this term um, several times in the last few weeks. We are, we are rebels against the rebellion. We, we are rebelling against, rather than participating in, the rebellion of, of Satan against God. We're rebelling against Satan's rebellion. And that's what, you know, that's what, what being released from slavery to the flesh means. And Christ gives us freedom to, um, to, do, to do the good things that, that he has set forth in advance for us to do. So without sanctification, we'll never please God. We'll never have any substantive influence on the world around us. Um, there are there are lots and lots of Christians. You've met them where their 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 life is indistinguishable from an unbeliever, um, and they have they may be able to explain very very clearly what the gospel is, um, but by their life, their testimony is the opposite. And, uh, and let's not let's not be those people. Let's let let's let the words of Peter and Paul and Christ, um, uh, you know, echo in our minds. We were bought with such a great price okay, that that our lives have to be dedicated, have to be sanctified to Him, and then He He um, He blesses that. God God blesses that, which is another amazing thing about God. Is He He sets us apart by His sovereign will, and then blesses our obedience, which He gave us the power to exercise. Amazing stuff. Okay, verse 16. Um, Keep a good conscience in the thing in which you are slandered. Those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. So, uh, it, if, if someone reviles you, if someone speaks evil of you, what is your primary defense? Your, your conscience, right? What? You smile at them? You smile in their face. You know, your primary defense is your, your knowledge that your conscience, which has been sanctified and which through effort and time and study has been biblically informed, okay? Because that's the only conscience that's worth anything is a conscience that's biblically informed based on what Scripture says. Okay? When someone says something about you, your first thing is, should be, okay, conscience, does this, does this ring true for you? Is there any hook that, that this reviling can have in me? Is there any ring of truth to that? Is there anything in that that I need to confess and repent of? Okay. So, so when someone reviles us and someone someone attacks us for one reason or another, and if you're not being attacked, by the way, it it could be uh, that that you're you're living close to the world. Um, so when you are attacked for righteousness' sake. Go to your conscience. Go to Scripture, and and and, and David says, "Thy word have I hidden in my in my heart that I might not sin against you." So you should have the word hidden in your heart enough that you go to your conscience. You say, "Okay, have I failed? How have I sinned? How have I how have I exhibited my flesh?" And and is this reviling, regardless of how the reviler meant it, 
Does this hit a target <laughs> in my soul? You know, and if it does, that 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 is another opportunity to sanctify God and to say, you know, you you are you are right. Uh, that that action of mine, that word of mine, that attitude of mine was not Christ-like. And I, you know, and and, and God has just used you. If God can use a donkey, you know, to speak to speak truth to a prophet, he can use an unbeliever to prick the conscience of a believer. Mm -hmm. And that's an opportunity for us not to slink away, but to say, you know, you're right. You're right. This is an area in which I'm still weak. I praise God that he has given me strength to overcome it, and that's my plan. So, um... I think we'll I think we'll quit there um, we just uh, just with this our consciences can remain clear as we continually confess our sin to God and trust that the blood of Jesus is sufficient to make us right with him we continue to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness Matthew 6:33 so so that's got to be that's got to be our goal and we have to be able to allow God to use whatever we, we, we must allow God to use whatever tool He chooses to use in our life um, to to conform us to His image, to cause us to seek first His His kingdom. And what comes next after seeking His kingdom? When we seek first the kingdom of God. What? All these things will be added. All these things. Will be added all, on these, you. all these things. Okay. So. That's kind of the bottom line for this little section. Any thoughts, questions, applications, concerns? I love you guys. Lord, thank you for your word. Work in us by it. Empowered by your Holy Spirit, Lord, change us so that we're more and more and more and more pleasing to you. That brings you glory. We ask it in the name of your Son, through whom, through whose death, we can approach you in prayer and worship and supplication. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Waldrop, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine and preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria.